Uh, my name is Ron. Hi, Ron. And uh, first of all, my wife and I would like to thank you for your teaching in Thessalonians. It's answered a lot of questions. Good. Which brings us to another question. Uh, and <laughs> it a, always does that, doesn't in it? In a worldly, ungodly way, I became the elect to ask the question <laughs> from our family. <laughs> sure. Um, we have a question with regard to Old Testament prophets. And when they're speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit, and they made promises to the people they were speaking to, if those promises, having been uh, adopted into this family, uh, are applicable to us. An example in, in Jeremiah, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, for your welfare, not for calamity, give you a future and a hope, you know that. Um, so is that for us today? Can we look at those promises? And there are many examples in the Old Testament and right. claim those as New Testament Christians. Yeah, very good question. Some promises in the Old Testament were made specifically to the nation of Israel, such as the land promises to Abraham's descendants, Genesis 12, 1, 3, and the Mosaic Covenant, Exodus 19, 24. Other promises are universal and apply to all believers, such as the promise of a new heart and spirit, found in Ezekiel 36, 26, which Christians believe is fulfilled in the New Covenant through Jesus Christ. There are some promises made specifically to the nation Israel. There are some promises made specifically to a, a, a group of people historically. But a promise like that, where God says, I know the plans that I have for you because you are my people, I think that's a universal promise. Um, you know, we don't have the promise, for example, of the land of Israel. That was given to the Jewish people. So there are promises that the context will tell you. But then there are those promises that simply reflect the Lord's pledge to provide all that He possesses to His own people, and that would be a part of that. Um, there are promises that God made specifically to Israel. For example, you hear people quote this all the time, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek God, then will I, I don't know the exact words, come from heaven and heal their land. That's a promise to the nation Israel with regard to their land. That's not a promise to the church that, that if we pray that, America is going to be healed. So there are promises that the context will tell you that, but th there, are, there are those general promises like that one that certainly stretched to all believers. In Jeremiah 31, the promise of a new heart, a new spirit, the new covenant promise, while directly given to Israel, extends to anyone who believes because the, the new covenant truth, the new covenant promises of God are given to all of those who come to God through the work of Christ. So the context will dictate that to you, but I think you need to embrace those general promises. Good. Thank you. Okay. The practice of speaking in tongues in the modern charismatic movement is often seen as different from the New Testament accounts. In Acts 2, speaking in tongues involves speaking in tongues, involves speaking in actual human languages, unknown to the speaker, but understood by listeners. In contrast, modern charismatic practices may involve glossolalia, which are often unintelligible utterances meant to be a private prayer language or prophetic speech. The belief that God allows sin to occur for His own purposes reflects the idea of divine sovereignty. While God does not cause sin, He permits it within His sovereign plan, using it ultimately for His redemptive purposes and the demonstration of His justice and mercy. Romans 8, 28. This study Bible, authored by John MacArthur, provides extensive commentary and notes from a conservative evangelical perspective. It is valued for its thorough exegesis and doctrinal insights, helping readers understand and apply biblical truths. Revelation 21, 4 describes the new heaven and earth as a place where there will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. The idea of delicacies might come from the description of the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19.9, symbolizing abundance and celebration in God's eternal kingdom. I hear people say all the time that before Jesus comes back, we're going to have a great revival on this earth. And I pray that that's true, but there's not anything in the Bible about that. In fact, the exact opposite is in the Bible. The Bible says that before he comes back, there's got to be a great falling away. But there is going to be a great revival after he comes back in the tribulation because the gospel is going to be preached by 144,000 sealed evangelists and by two special keynote evangelists 
and there will be thousands and thousands of people who will be saved, but they will be saved in an, in an environment where it won't be like going to church to hear the good things about the Christian life. If you're a Christian, you will pay for it every day yeah. and ultimately with your life. So you have the martyrs. Right. And then you have the 144,000 right. different players on the, right. on the stage, on the right. world stage. Right. The 144,000 evangelists profile them for us. And well, how, how does this unfold there? You know, there's evangelism? a... When you get into prophecy, if, you, if you've read it as widely as I have, you know that there's somebody wants to argue about every point. Sure. And one of the things that I think is interesting, I mentioned in one of our earlier sessions that the Bible is a self-interpreting book. Mm -hmm. So wh what is the deal with the 144,000? And I can't get over the fact that there's a section in the book of Revelation about this long, and here's what it says. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. I mean, it's monotonous. It goes all the way down. It mentions yeah. every single tribe, and it says, of the 144,000, 12,000 are from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So what we got going here is 144,000 saved, spirit-filled Jewish evangelists. And I believe, uh, I can't I believe they're celibates. I think they're, they're. I don't think they're married. I think they're men who are just committed to to the gospel, and they go all over the world. And because of their of their fervor and their faith, the the, the enemy destroys them, and uh, they end up in heaven. And the Bible says that there's a special place in the in heaven where these hundred forty four thousand are gathered around the throne, and they're singing praise to the Lord. Are the Two witnesses, the two prophets are, are they're good guys, not bad oh, guys. Oh yeah, they're good guys. And they're famous guys, not unknown guys. No. Famous if you know the Bible. First of all, these two witnesses are not necessarily preaching mercy and grace. They're preaching judgment. What they're saying is, hey, listen, if you don't like what you're seeing going on here today, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. And they're calling people to repentance. And the uh, and the Bible says they have special power. Nobody can take them out. You know, they try to kill them. And the Bible says, out of their mouth, fire comes. It's almost like something you would see in a high a science movie or something. Mm -hmm. But God gives them this power to repel those who try to hurt them. And then ultimately that power is taken away and they're allowed to die. They're killed. And the Bible says they take their carcasses and put them out in the street and leave them there for three and a half days. And then the Bible says the entire world sees these two witnesses laying in the streets of Jerusalem. And on at the end of the three and a half days, they are resurrected to life and the entire world watches it, I think probably on, on television. Sure. And they see this event and nobody misses it. And and then uh, they, they go to heaven. And of course, the the impact these two men have is to, is to call people to repentance. And the issue that always comes up is, who are these guys? Some interpretations of eschatology, particularly in dispensational premillennialism, believe that after the church is raptured, taken out of the world, there will be a period of tribulation. During this time, 144,000 Jews will lead a great global revival, bringing many to salvation, Revelation 7 and 14. These points reflect a range of theological beliefs and interpretations, often influenced by specific doctrinal frameworks and eschatological views. Here's a brief summary. One Old Testament Promises Differentiating between promises specific to Israel and those universal to all believers. 2. Speaking in Tongues Distinguishing between the biblical account and modern charismatic practices. 3. God's Sovereignty and Sin Understanding how God permits sin within his sovereign plan for redemptive purposes. 4. MacArthur Study Bible. Using this study Bible, using this study Bible for deeper biblical understanding from a conservative evangelical perspective. 5. New Heaven and Earth. Anticipating a future without sickness, filled with abundance and celebration. 6. Post Rapture Salvation. Belief in a future global revival led by 144,000 Jews after the church is raptured. These themes provide a comprehensive view of various theological concepts within Christian doctrine.